everybody that we know is obsessed with shows like that, Succession and the White Lotus and the like. And that's because obsession with social status and money and things like that are consuming elements of the chattering class. But I don't think they're consuming elements of the lives of most people when they sit down and they want to watch something on their screen. Last week, we asked Mohamed al Arian what the economy and the markets would look like in 2023. Sticking with a version of that theme, we wanted to ask our friend and frequent guest on this podcast, John Podhoritz, what we're going to actually watch in 2023. What's happening to the film and television industry and what's happening to our consumption habits? John, who's been on this podcast to talk about a range of issues, is a writer, public intellectual, and culture critic. He's the editor-in-chief of Commentary Magazine, which I'm a big fan of and I'm on the board of. He's host of Commentary's award-winning daily podcast. He's a columnist for the New York Post. He was film critic for the Weekly Standard and now writes frequent reviews of television and film for the Washington Free Beacon. This is Call Me Back. And I'm pleased to welcome back to this podcast, fan favorite, longtime friend, John Podhortz. John, thanks for coming on. Hi, Dan. I mean, look, I'm no Muhammad Alarion, but I'll, I'll do in a pinch. I'll do, do you in a mind, pinch by the way, need... that you come on right at, so our last, the last episode was Muhammad Alarion, and I know I mean, you're, I, you're I, a I don't, huge fan. I, 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 I don't mind. I feel very um, insecure uh, because uh, his episodes are just amazingly great, and now, you know, I got to, it's like going on after... You know, uh, it's like being, you go on after Jerry Seinfeld to do a to do a stand up like, you know, in the lineup. That's that's not good. So, <laughs> yeah, you. Uh, yeah. But, you know, what's amazing about Muhammad, uh, among many other things, is that he can swing from talking about like the Fed funds rate and go deep on it. And and then suddenly we're deep in the the Meadowlands and talking about the jet season. Yeah, and he's just as deep on that. I mean, that's a well a well rounded person. Yeah, but you have range too. Okay, and well. <laughs> so so with Mohammed, it, do, it do, doesn't about... make me any money. My range, my range. May, it's the, the big, big distinction here is that um, is <laughs> right. that I'm not no, I'm not the no president of the university. I didn't run. Yes, I didn't run the world's largest hedge fund. <laughs> Nothing. No one's but asking I do you run rage. Pimco or the I Harvard rage Management that Company. That nickel will get me a cup of coffee, right. but yeah, You're right. You've got range. Um, so, so with Muhammad, we talked about the economy in 2023, and so with you, we're going to talk about television and film in 2023, and looking ahead and trying to understand. Like with Muhammad, it was like, what the hell is going to be happening in the economy and the markets for the next year? And with you, we're going to talk about what are people going to be watching for the next year something you and I have talked about offline. And I want to start by reading, uh, 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 quoting Derek Thompson, who's been on this podcast, who writes for The Atlantic. You know him, actually. I think Derek Thompson is like often much maligned on the commentary podcast, but or at least during COVID he was. But he's a, uh, he's a smart guy. So he wrote this piece that, that just came out in The Atlantic where he goes, he tries to understand why there are all these mass layoffs in tech. And because he, he, he says, actually, they don't really make sense. But, but he's trying to figure out all the possible culprits. And one of them, and I'm quoting here, is he says, many people predicted that the di- digitization of the pandemic economy in 2020, such as the rise in streaming entertainment and online food delivery apps and at-home fitness were, quote, accelerations, pushing us all into a future that was coming anyway. In this interpretation, the pandemic was a time machine, hastening the 2030s, and raising tech valuations accordingly. Hiring, hiring boomed across tech as companies added tens of thousands of workers to meet this expectation of acceleration. So basically he was saying, which in the early version of this podcast, our post-corona podcast, which is why actually we had Derek Thompson on, we were trying to figure out what, what, the, what are the big changes that were coming that, you know, if you, if you believe, or as he's pointing to, is you believe that like 
we thought all these things were going to come in the 30s or the 2030s or 2040s, and the pandemic just brought them in 2020 and 2021. And that was the new normal, that that was going to stay. It just moved everything up. It accelerated. And, you know, that, that was how we were going to consume television and film. And now the time machine seems to be a bust. It seems that if you just look at recent news and entertainment, it's w w something's reverting back to pre-pandemic. And so I, I know you have views on this, and so I want you to talk, tell us, are, are, is the time, was the time machine thing completely overstated, and why? Not only, I've come to believe that not only was it overstated, but that, but that this will be a, a moment that will be worth studying in the business schools of the future, or let's say the last, the years immediately before the pandemic into the pandemic, uh, in which the um, entertainment industry um, committed grave self-harm uh, in the guise of attempting to get itself right with the future, that it <clears throat> cut off various of its limbs thinking that a stronger limb would grow in its place, and that didn't happen. So I'm thinking about how the entertainment industry uh, accelerated like crazy in the 1970s and the 1980s due to the simultaneous entry into the business of cable television and home video devices, right? First the VCR, then the, then the DVD player. And suddenly this business, which had two arms, right? It had theatrical distribution and television, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly had three or four. So there were more ancillary. Suddenly there was more money to be made. You made a movie. You sold it to TV. That was all there was. Then and suddenly the, you had a movie. Broadcast television. So suddenly it was on broadcast ABC Broadcast television. With ads. And, 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 to, and to syndicated television. And to, and right. to, you know. But you sold it and then there was ad supported. The revenue generated yeah. was ads right. for the So for you the made money. You had, so you had, two, you had two bites of the apple. Mm -hmm. Put it in theaters, made money from that. You sold it to television, you made money from that. Suddenly there are two more stops along the way. You have, um, or there's one more stop on the way, which is home video, which starts as a rental business. So you rent, then you also, then, and cable television comes in. So you sell it not only to broadcast television, but to cable television, and then you can rent it at a movie theater. And then eventually DVDs come in and then you can buy it or become a collector. And then, so there's suddenly, there's way more money to be made producing uh, filmed entertainment. Way more. Just simply because the marketplace opened up and then China opens up. There's all sorts of different, you know, the internationalization of the business. So suddenly this very respectable, high dollar <coughs> uh, cash business <clears throat> becomes a very big deal in terms of what, what you can produce and these blockbusters start getting made and all of that. What happened when streaming came in is that streaming killed two of the, killed the home video market, right? So it killed off the DVD because now you didn't have to own something. You could, you could find it and rent it instantaneously. It killed off the home video store and the DVD store and and that was a serious threat. Suddenly, your 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 market is being you know. Be, suddenly, you got less of a market, right? Streaming so, combined with with mobile and tablets, right, right. So yeah. altogether, you know, you you have a, a threat to this very healthy business because one of its one of its um, ancillary money making arms basically goes away. So then a madness grips around the mid-2010s, a madness grips the entire industry, which is streaming comes in, that's Netflix. It's pretty much entirely Netflix. And Netflix becomes a Wall Street darling around 2012, 2013. And Netflix aims a bazooka at conventional entertainment, the conventional entertainment business. It says, we're going to lose as much money as we possibly can in order to claim market share. So not only are we 
you know, selling this monthly subscription, we're going to spend 10 to $20 billion a year just making stuff that will go on our service. And we are going to eat everybody's lunch. And everybody else goes bananas. Bob Iger, now back at Disney after his retirement, writes a book called uh, The Ride of a Lifetime. And he described, at the beginning of the book, he describes this moment in 2015 when he takes everybody to an offsite of his business and he says, we must radically re revolutionize our business because streaming is going to kill us. What year, we, what year does he? 2015. 2015, okay. We need to create, we need to take a dominant position in streaming entertainment or we're going to be destroyed. And uh, sets this path in motion in which they they need to create Disney Plus, and uh, it takes years to create Disney Plus. As it turns out, <clears throat> they need a good interface. I don't know. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Anyway, so Disney, all these, and then as since he jumps into it, and they're the they're the most successful conventional entertainment. Uh, conglomerate Disney, right? It owns Star Wars. It owns Marvel. It makes more money than anybody else. It has it has it has all sorts of television assets. It owns ABC. That it buys Fox. It's huge, and it's like if we don't get into this, we're going to die. And everybody else says, "Well, Bob Iger is the best entertainment executive in the world. He knows what he's talking about. We all have to get into this, or we're going to die." There's this mad rush towards streaming. So suddenly. Uh, not only, and so what is it that they can sell on their streaming services to get, get market share once they go up? It's, we have stuff that you can't get anywhere else. So you got to come to us. So Disney under, if you're, if you're in this mindset, Disney's like, okay, we're going to put as much stuff on here. We're going to make stuff for it, but we're also going to put stuff on it. You can't get anywhere else. And uh, we're going to use our conventional brands from all of our other, from movies and from television, to sell our streaming service, to get people to subscribe to our streaming service. So suddenly Pixar, the most successful animating studio, you know, basically of all time, 19 straight hits or something like that, three of its four movies are put on, or all of its movies are essentially put on the streaming service first. Star Wars, the most expensive property that it bought, suddenly has a TV show that's very successful, The Mandalorian, but it's on the streaming service. It's not on ABC, which has a vastly larger audience in the streaming service, or on the Disney Channel, which also actually has a large audience on, on cable. Um, Everybody else follows suit. There's all this, you know, desperate effort to gain market share against Netflix. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? So they had this business, motion picture and television, but let's just say motion picture. It's an eleven billion that grosses eleven billion dollars a year. Uh, and obviously, the pandemic comes in and vastly disrupts it, and is you know they can't make money from it. But it's eleven billion dollar a year business. And and even if the pandemic hadn't happened, this I think would have happened inevitably, given the focus on this. They basically say, "Eh, we're looking at this now, so we're not going to care about this over here. Our focus, and we're trying to convince Wall Street that our focus is this streaming." And they basically make moves that do critical damage not only to their theatrical distribution which again is an $11 billion a year business, but to their television and cable systems, which are in direct competition with streaming because it's the same device. Right. You watch, you could watch ABC if you own, you could watch ABC or the Disney Channel or you could watch Disney Plus, but you can't watch all three at the same time. Right. So um, why... This fascinates me is that they took existing healthy businesses and harmed them in pursuit of a business that had not yet matured on the grounds that if they didn't get in and throw themselves in, they're going to be left behind. Now, let me, let me ask you, you're a, you're a, you're a businessman and I'm not, but, um, 
my own I business. Don't, the media don't business. undersell yourself. Okay. The commentary no, magazine media... platform, the Glop yes. platform. Okay. You guys, you guys, <laughs> okay. you, you... but you're a mini, you're a mini okay. Rupert. But go ahead. Okay. But in my business, my business was the media business was materially damaged by all kinds of technological innovations that really did, you know, mean that it, it would no longer hold the kind of financial sway over cities and things like that, newspapers and that that it, that it once had. But there was the same thing. It's like if we don't get into this now, we're going to we're going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. Is that the way business actually works? Does it does it help to be the early adopter? I'm not sure that if you're Disney and you have a very powerful, strong brand, that you can't wait and go in when everything is mature. You're the leading, you're the leading, you have the leading position in the already extant fields. And the idea that you need to be in the early war to establish uh, dominance, I think is 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 a is a misunderstanding. Like let Netflix mature the business, then you go in. Like Netflix isn't the Xerox machine yeah, but there, and no one and else can make a copy. Especially in tech, there's always this fear of of the first, you know, the early adopter who's going to capture the early adopters. If we don't capture the early adopters, someone else is going to own the early adopters. Right. And, you know, it's it's the there's there's iPhone and then there's, you know, everyone else. And everyone else is right. not the iPhone. Right. But it's these are not that's what's interesting is I think that these businesses started being viewed on Wall Street as tech businesses, as Silicon Valley right. businesses, and not yeah. as a century-old media business that began with radio, moved into Victrolas, moved into motion pictures, moved into television, and the like, with its own richness, its own history, its own way of doing things, and that suddenly it was like, man, you can really, somebody, you could make your, you could, uh, you know, you could be... Uh, you could get your stock price to 280 right. or 400 or something like that, and then everybody is rich in a way that no one ever imagined being rich. So let's say you're a person who makes, I just like, you make $10 million a year, but somebody says, you know, you can make $200 million a year. So you're like, well, I'm going to do everything I can to make $200 million a year. Well, that's a risk, and your risk is that you're going to threaten your $10 million a year income hunting the snark of $200 million a year. And I think that's what happened this year with the with the collapse of streaming, which happened, which clearly was a bubble because it all happened in kind of a week when Netflix simply announced that it had stopped growing in one quarter, that it had lost 2 million subscribers or something like that in one quarter. At the same time that there's rising inflation, at the same time that interest rates are going up. So there is this yeah. macro, uh, macro. there are macro events happening there beyond the control of Netflix combined with a quote-unquote, for the first time, we're not growing. Right. Which I right. think it causes the panic. Well, here's what the other interesting thing about streaming in terms of its being the replacement, the next thing. So yeah, Netflix made a lot of programming. And it made a lot of movies and that sort of thing. But um, your Disney, your NBC, your you know, uh, your Comcast, your Viacom, you, you know, you own these broadcast networks and television stations and movie studios. And um, one thing that you see because you're alarmed by the fact that other people are making money on it is streaming is very undiscriminating. Novelty does not sell streaming. The most popular show on, on Netflix for several years was The Office, which had gone off the air right. 10 years earlier. Um, somebody, I can't remember who, The Office and Seinfeld and some other show. Friends. Friend, friends, right. Warner Bros. Somebody paid close to a billion dollars just to get Friends off Netflix and on their service. Mm -hmm. Friends had been off the air. Not only had Friends been off the air for 20 years, but you could watch it every night. 
in your city and on and on Nick at night. So streaming is not discriminating. Novelty, you don't need novelty to sell to sell streaming, it turns out. You just need crowd pleasing entertainment. So why do I why do I bring this up? Only because well, that explains the the, the style of content too. I mean, the, right. the the genre of content going back to another era. Yeah. So, but my point is like being the supplier of new material that then can go onto streaming. The way movies would then go onto VHS and then go onto cable and onto broadcast. Why is that bad? Why? 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 Like what in what mindset do you look at something and say, you know, I made something 20 years ago that sold just sold for a billion dollars again. Like I resold for the 18th time for a billion dollars. That's a pretty good business. You know, if I make a sitcom now that people like in five years, I could sell it for a billion dollars after I sell it into syndication and I run it on my network and I do this and I do that. It seems like these businesses cut off their primary source of income and the business that they controlled in pursuit of a tertiary or secondary source of income in a business that they did not control and did not entirely understand. And that's why I say I think it's like a model for study for uh, gold rushes. Like I understand when a poor person in 1849 sells everything, gets a wagon and goes to go pan for gold in California. I don't understand why, you know, the Biddles of Philadelphia would do that when they were already rich and running banks in the East. And this is the equivalent of the Biddles saying, my bank doesn't count. I'm going to go and pan for gold in, you know, <laughs> you know, in, in California or the Yukon. It's, it's bizarre. It's a, it was a bizarre turn of events, but it was created by an atmosphere of panic. And the atmosphere of panic is... Everything's changing. This is the 21st century. We just don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we can jump on a bandwagon or do something, and that'll give us some sense of direction, as opposed to like, I'm putting down my head. This is what I know how to do. We're going to, you know, we're going to go through a storm, but, you know, maybe we will, we're the ones who are going to survive the storm because we make money. We make money now, and we're all going into a business in which Netflix had yet, when Iger announced that Disney was going to revolutionize itself and pursue this event. Netflix was losing billions of dollars a year. Now, granted, okay, right. you could see down spending, the road. Spending, over-investing, gonna... spending a fortune on content. Yeah. But it worked. I mean, in some ways you could say that they it's a little like uh, SDI or, or something. It's like right. they terrified... They terrified the uh, you know the old the old guard into you know saying well we can't possibly compete. They spent seventeen billion dollars on content a year, and then Disney said well we better we better say uncle and give up because we can't compete with this. But of course how, it could how, compete with this. How I mentioned tablets before. The reality is I I, I got to believe some of the calculation was that every one of us is walking around with a supercomputer that has a screen a very visually uh, satisfying screen to watch content on and our walk around with it in our pockets, and they just assume that there would be all this streaming consumption on these devices. Right. And and my I watch an entire generation now consuming content on their devices, but it's not the streaming services content. It's TikTok. It's TikTok, right. And what's TikTok? It's 20 seconds long. See, there was right. this idea because it's hard to do this, right? It's hard to conceptualize where these things are going. So it makes sense if you think about it logically that if you have this little phone that you can't pay attention to something little in front of you like this for, you know, 20 minutes without blinking. Like there's too many distractions in your line of sight and, you know, there's going to be a plot development and you're going to miss it. And okay. So TikTok's perfect because these things are 20 seconds long and you can kind of concentrate on them for 20 seconds. And then when somebody walks by in the street, you can still not bump into them because you're, you're, they, you, you, you will have time to avoid running into them. And this I think is true in general. Like Bob Iger ran 
an entertainment conglomerate, and then he got envious of the stock price of a company that did one thing. You know, it streamed content to people, and then it made content, so it did two things. But he had a movie studio, he had television networks, he had sports channels, he had amusement parks, he had this company that did all this stuff surpassingly well, and he risked it all to get into an a immature business that did something that wasn't organic to what he knew. And that's the business story, I think, of the streaming era is that Netflix tricked all these companies into wasting tens of billions of dollars. That, not that it, it, it didn't trick them because it didn't want it to. It, you know, I'm sure it th- is worried about it because it doesn't want this, you know, it doesn't want to be right. competed with. But they all fell for, you know, like going after this, this future that may not happen. I mean, we don't know what's, we don't, I mean, it'll happen. Like it's a, one way of, of consuming entertainment is to get it by ordering it up on demand, which is all streaming so, is. Right. Right. It's, is it's that you don't watch it on their schedule. You watch it on your schedule. It's Peloton. I want to work out when I want to work out. I don't want to go to a yeah. class. I, yeah. I just decide when I get my, the, my virtual trainer to show up and do my, yeah. right. Okay, so now let's talk about the the actual kind of content that's being created because that's also right. a little bit of like what's what's new is old again. So yeah, so you and I last night were talking about this this new show, Night Court, which is not <laughs> a new show, right? Night Court. When I was growing up, Night Court was in the eighties. I think the first episode was in nineteen eighty four. It had a run of about eight to ten years, in which uh, Harry Anderson, who most listeners I guess on this podcast won't. No, but Harry Anderson was an actor who played a he was a he was a judge on a night shift of a Manhattan criminal court. And this was an NBC original series, you know, eighties, early nineties, and then it ended in I think ninety two. And it's back. Right? It's not well, a it's new not show. Only, it's a very old show. It's not show. only back. It's not only back. If you went and said, What were the ten great shows of the nineteen eighties that everybody remembers fondly? Cheers. Right. And Night Court had this had this long run, right? It, it was right, a long yeah. run. It's a sort of a wacky, it was a wacky sitcom. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the conventional NBC sitcom, which was, you know, sort of set. It was set in this kind of wacky night night world, right? So, but yeah, Cheers, uh, the Cosby show. Um yeah. I know there, but okay. Night Court would not necessarily come up in your list of like the ten shows that people remember fondly from the eighties. So uh, they premiered this new version of Night Court last week or the week before on NBC. And the first episode gets 10 million viewers. <laughs> Nothing on broadcast television anymore outside of football Sports gets 10 today. million viewers. Back to that. Football right. gets 10 million viewers and nothing else gets 10 million viewers on network broadcast conventional, you know, one of the big four networks. Just doesn't happen anymore. A big hit gets 8 million or 9 million. This was 10 million viewers. What? This is like pre-existing IP, as they call it, right? They were launching pre-existing IP. Of course, when Night Court was on, people watched it for 10 years. Then it was in syndication, though it didn't seem to do particularly well because it doesn't have a long tail. 20, 25, 30 million people were watching it. So it turns out 30, 40 years later, people are like, I like Night Court. Oh, there's a new Night Court. Oh, look, the guy, the big star of Night Court, who actually wasn't Harry Anderson, but was the secondary comic player, John Larroquette, he's back on it, playing the same character. I like that. I'm going to watch it. 10 million people watched it. And then apparently the next week, 8 million people, it retained most of its audience. 8 million people watched it. So we keep getting these signals from television over time that people liked old-fashioned broadcast television. They liked it. They didn't, once, when they didn't have any choice but broadcast television, 40 million people watched it, right? We'll watch, or, you know, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Now there's lots of choices, and the 
and the market is divided. But it's still the case that if you provide something that people want to watch, 10 million people will watch it at the same time. That's a good business. You can sell a lot of ads against that audience and make an enormous amount of money. Um, and then it makes you ask whether, again, the decision-making on the part of the people who do this has been skewed for so long because they want to be edgy or they want to be, they want to advance the form, like not even bad motives. Like they want to be a place that creative well, people. We want to be part of the conversation. The yeah. conversation. Maybe so the you don't conversation, conversation as defined by what's on Twitter and yeah. what's in right. So right. so right. so there's these now, elite conversations just, yeah. about Mad right. Men and about White Lotus now yeah. or about you right. know Succession Three is coming out. Yeah. It's the conversation. Everyone's talking about it. Who's everyone? Your yeah, point is no, not those right. ten people watching right. Night Court, right? So ten million people watch Night Court, and they're and and maybe some of them watch the second season of The White Lotus, which was the sensation of last year. I didn't see the. I saw the first season, and I I liked it, and I gather the second season is pretty good. It's like six or seven episodes. You know, there's a there's a kid, someone dies at a at a resort, and there are you know three different storylines and you don't know who did it and it's and, a, and, it's, and it's a and it's a it's an infomercial for high-end travel to italy right exactly so my but <laughs> the thing is like the broadcast business shrank because of first cable and then home video and then you know whatever and then streaming it's still a mammoth business and people for some reason forgot that or they're like you know what we're gonna do we're just gonna make game shows because they're cheap and no one's watching and da, da, da. so yeah they make game shows so then they have a business that they're they have a thing that people like and they kind of play into the fact that it's a declining business rather than trying to strengthen it by you know making stuff pleasing stuff now by the way i should say it's not that you could just summon up a formula to make pleasing stuff like it's hard you know most things fail it's not like they want to make things that'll flop they don't but all the energy the ancillary energy went into doing other things um you know like boosting the strength of other businesses boosting the strength of your cable business boosting the strength of your streaming business whatever and then, as I say, you have this business sitting there that can summon up, you know, 10 million people when nothing does anymore. You know, there was a time in the 1950s, Reader's Digest, in a country that was half the size, population-wise, had 50 million subscribers. Or the TV Guide had 50 million subscribers. That kind of thing. There's no magazine today, I think, that actually has a million subscribers. Like, like solid... ARP probably has that many, but that's because people are members of ARP. Like, all these businesses have shrunk because the market for, di di you know, diversion has expanded so radically. But if you have one, you shouldn't neglect it. So your point is yeah, White Lotus, Succession, these kinds of shows that are part of the conversation among elites and among, you know, journalists and public intellectuals and... That that's not going to be the genre that's going to be produced. It's we're going to be seeing more night court type stuff. And I, I on that first category, you and I were talking the other day about there is this quality to those shows that I mean I don't know if class warfare is the right right um, phrase, but there's just this this unbelievable over characterization and demonization villainization of you know, the 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 rich and famous in these yeah. shows in a, in a way that you know obviously there's always been an element of that in popular culture, but it's like at a whole other level. There's not a single character in any of these shows, right? That have a redeeming quality. I mean, right. even if you go back to like The Sopranos or uh, or um, I don't know no, any Dynasty, of these. I don't know. Yeah, like the the original ones, like Dynasty right. in Dallas. Like right. there are always a couple of good people. Who are being right. tormented by the bad people, right? 
but they were they were usually they were like people from modest circumstances who were suddenly elevated into the you know into the upper reaches of society and it must save their souls from being corrupted by the by the rich right. evil people but that that's a real thing that's a classic you know that's a classic dynamic in literature from the from you know whatever from the get go but that's not what's happening now no in these shows so, I'm setting so what's so going on so here's what yeah go ahead no, I was going to say this. No, so, so what's going on? So those shows, everybody, lo- everybody that we know, is obsessed with shows like that. Uh, Separate Succession shows the like White Succession Lotus and, and, the White. and right, yeah, right, right, and and that's because obsession with social status and money and things like that are consuming elements of uh, the the chattering class, but. I don't think they're consuming elements of the lives of most people when they sit down and they want to watch something on their screen. Like this is not this is not what eats them up. Um, it eats you know it's like it eats you up if you went to college with a Murdoch and then he's a Murdoch and then you're like man that's not fair you know or. You know, you worked somewhere. You were at a you were at a resort, and there were these people who had nicer rooms than you. And you're like, why do they get a nice room and I don't? Like that, it's understandable. It's like the thing is, like you're you you get close enough to fantastic wealth and power if you're a person in these positions. This is what David Brooks called the status income dis- disequilibrium. Like you're a writer, or you were this, or you were that, and you went to college with these people, and you. You know they might even have gone to their weddings or something like that, but you know some they just live a different level of life than you are, and you're just much of your life is taken with feelings of inadequacy, rage, disappointment, and envy, and that is characterized in the entertainment that you like to watch. But if you're like a person near the median income in the United States, which is I think sixty eight thousand dollars a year or something like that family income you're not you don't really care what the murdochs do you don't care like you know maybe you're interested in you know you, you probably don't even the, know who the murdochs are like or you're just even not, if you're not you know you don't you're care not following it's, it right yeah right so so and then this gets confused as you would say because the conversation takes place and even though you are running a populist business like and like entertain mass entertainment where what you want is to get into the national bloodstream in a way that will get you four to five to ten to fifteen percent of the overall population of the United States to consume your product, but you can't get out of the buzz in your head of the top 05 percent who are making all the noise around you, and you have to clear your head, but it's really hard to clear your head, and they and they. And so you have very unimaginative ways in which entertainment executives do this, right? So they know if you run, again, a broadcast network, if you run CBS or NBC, what you know is you're probably going to have a pretty good experience putting on a mystery cop show. A cop show like CSI or NCIS or any of the Law and Orders yeah, let's go, okay, you, let's yeah. go through them, right? Okay. Law and Order franchise began in 1990. Yeah, they have CSI, three. They have two or three shows on the air. Two or three Law and Orders on the air. They have a CSI, reboot of the original Law and Order. They have yeah. sexual perversion yeah. unit or whatever that thing is called, <laughs> and then they have organized crime. There are right. three Chicago shows on produced by the same guy, Dick Wolf. Chicago Fire, Chicago Med, and Chicago PD. Yeah, all of which are crime shows. Like even Chicago Fire is a crime show because it's about firefighters, but it's always an arson or something like that. Okay, CSI on CBS, you have CSI, CSI. which began in two thousand, <laughs> um, or the CSI knockoffs, NCIS, which yeah. is which has I think two or three NCISs, and Blue Bloods. Which is this astoundingly long-running show about a family of cops in New York? Yeah, NYB, NYPD family. By the way, right. you you left out SWAT. Oh, FBI. There's, a SWAT There's show two and FBI. FBI's right. and a SWAT right. show. Okay. So right. what do they know? They know people like these shows, so they just put them on. 
They don't try to advance the form. They don't try. They know that this is what people like, and they they try to By brand the way, them. Blue Bloods. This, I'm just pulling this up. Yeah. Blue Bloods, which debuted in 2010, yeah. rarely dips below 10 million viewers per episode. Yeah, right. So, so Blue Bloods, which is a very pedestrian show, I've and watched there's two 911 shows. By the yeah, way, yeah, two nine. Okay, so. What they know is going. people will watch these. I know too much about these. No, but no. What's interesting? So people will watch these, um, but they don't promote them. They don't try to get them Emmys. They don't work to like get, make them part of the national conversation. Um, and so you have these two different tracks. So as I say, it's very hard for them to get out of the the but the noise, the buzz in their ears from Twitter and the conversation of the hyper. You know the hyper uh, aware media online people and all of that, but they do know they need to make some money, and so unimaginatively they'll they'll put on four FBI shows because they know that works, but they're not going to look for something new. And in totality, these cop shows are generating something like seventy five million viewers. I mean, it's some in unbelievable yeah. number, right? Yeah, and and you know, basically, this is the. Uh, this is the on backbone average. of this is the backbone of what what remains on 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 network, and that's not television. counting all the all the um, the and they're on streamers, re- right? They're all on streamers. So and also you know, the reality cop shows also, which yeah. were very controversial during the summer of twenty twenty post right. George. Well, Floyd these riots. cop shows were controversial. So there's a like. Like so, when when uh, George Floyd happened, and there was all the defund the police talk, and of course everybody in Hollywood was you know like joining in and allyship and all yeah, of that. Yeah, they're announcing we're pulling we're pulling the yeah we're pulling yeah, so this they content pulled from our cops life, yeah. right. They right. stopped running cops, uh, which is like the oldest one of the oldest shows on television had been running since 1985 or something like that. And then there's a sitcom called Brooklyn Nine Nine. Yeah. My kids my love. Kids, my NBC. kids are obsessed. Are yeah. you kidding? So, so Brooklyn Nine Nine goes through this crisis because it's like, what do we do? We're a cop show and we're a sitcom, but of course, cops are bad. So they're right. going to make a last. Andy season. Samberg freaking out with his agent. What did you get me yeah. into? Yeah. So they make this last season, and like, what they have <laughs> is that the that the uh, the gay black captain of the police department has resigned when the show comes on because he can no longer be a, a policeman because uh, things are so so terrible. And then so he is kind of like the sacrificial lamb, and then they go on and they do wacky cop stuff for another eight episodes, and then they, and then they end. So um, it's, it was pretty lame. But yeah, so I just think, again, so my, my, my ultimate point here is By the is way, my, one of my yeah. sons who's obsessed, both my sons are obsessed with Brooklyn yeah. Nine-Nine, and they can just watch episode after episode yeah. after episode. So the other night I introduced one of them to The Office, and we just started watching old episodes mm-hmm. of The Office, which he absolutely loved. Yeah. And he says, wow, this reminds me of what Brooklyn Nine-Nine used to be. Right. Yeah. Or, no, The Office. And um, my kids also love Parks and Rec, which right. is – and and again, those shows, which is all, often true of broadcast shows that went into syndication, most famously Star Trek, which had a three-year, not very successful run on NBC and then became this – pop culture phenomenon for half a century after that. Um, you know, you'd have these shows that did okay, would go into syndication, and then audiences would find them and go berserk and watch them forever. Um, and that's also happened on streaming. That's part of what I'm what I'm talking about. There was a, you know, there are shows that get canceled off networks. There was a show called Lucifer in which the devil comes back and starts solving crimes in L.A. I'm not not kidding. That's the plot. He runs a nightclub and he solves <laughs> crimes. Lucifer. Okay. Lucifer. Okay? So that show is on Fox for three years. They cancel it. It goes on Netflix. It's a huge bonanza for Netflix, and then they make three more years of it. They take it from the network because it's working on their system. So, like, that's why I'm saying... The streamers are undiscriminating. The best way I could look at it is say DVDs come in and they make a lot of money. And then imagine a world in which in 1992 the head of, you know, Jack Welch announces that henceforth their entire business is going to be directed toward producing DVDs. 
Streaming is just a method of distribution. It's right. it's like looking at the reverse. It's end not of a the genre. Telescope. It's a, it's it's just it's it's. It's a, not even it's a, a medium. It's it is right. a method. It is a method of distribution, and it's going to be an incredibly efficient method of distribution, and therefore your worst methods of distribution are probably going to fall by the wayside. There's no question about it. That's one of the reasons that movie th- movies will never come back the way that they were once, because it's not an efficient way. To a method of distribution to make people leave their homes, drive somewhere, yeah. park, buy a ticket, buy food, you know, buy get a babysitter, all of that. Like it's an inefficient way to get something that you could get more efficiently, and it will exist in some form, but it's not going to be the way it it, it was. Simply because you're going to get better. You're not going to have people talking at the screen when you're in your own house and you're going to be able to go in the kitchen, make your own popcorn for 22 cents instead of $9 a bucket. And it's just, you know, in that way, it, ca- it can't go back the way, the and, way and, and the medium can help tee up for you based on all the impressions it gets from your viewing habits, figure out exactly what you want to watch and put things on your radar screen that you may not have ever occurred to you yeah, because very, they just have all this data on you. Yeah, I, I, I'm skeptical. That's like super about- efficient. I, yeah, I'm sort of skeptical about that stuff. I'm not. I'm not sure why. Because um, maybe it's just because anecdotally or personally, that doesn't work on me. Like you know, when it says you might like yeah, this, and it's at the bottom. I know I'm not. I'm not a conventional yeah. viewer, right. so I understand that. But and I understand this idea that you can harness the the date the tech. You can harness right. the data. But every time I hear people talk about that, then you get immediately to how Russia, you know, Russia won Trump the election through the harnessing of big data. And I start getting a little, eh, I don't know about that stuff. I don't know. But but we should talk about the everything old is new again stuff because the thing about Night Court is we're going to see every single show from the 1980s now that you'd never, that only had two seasons I see Magnum you know. PI is now up. Magnum PI, yeah, is on. But like you know, you're gonna have like, I mean, literally, Magnum, I yeah. name shows you haven't, you don't even remember. Ten Speed and Brown Shoe, Hard Castle and McCormick. Uh, eight is enough. Eight is a, yeah. Like you're just, they're just, you know, because they have a name that people remember, and because old people watch broadcast television, so it skews that way, and so they're gonna remember, and then maybe you get. Their kids yeah, so they're literally to. just going to use up. It's not just the concept of the show. Yeah. They're going to be what they call these pre-aware titles, right? That right. These titles conjure up yeah. some kind of nostalgia for people. Now, for people a lot then of... say this is terrible. Like Ross Douthat wrote a book called The Decadent Society in which he said yeah. the problem is that we're not making things new. We're just right. rebooting old things. But if you think about it, um, so it's not titles in the old days, but, you know, what people don't know is that half of the movies made in the motion picture industry from 1915 till 1980, half of the movies made in the United States were Westerns. Half. Most of them don't even exist anymore. Like they were made for five cents and they were on bad film stock and the film stock degraded and they, they, they vanished. Like they, you don't even know they exist. Think about what that means. That means that 200 movies a year were being made. There were like Hallmark Christmas movies. There were 200 movies a year were being made. They were Westerns. That's the decadent society. All Westerns have exactly the same plot. A lone guy against a rancher or a cattle thief or a, you know, a bad rancher or a bad cattle thief or a, you know, a, a, a gang that comes into town. There's no difference. The plots are exactly the same. So this is always true of popular culture. Everything... Everything is an iteration of something else, and everybody always tries to limit de- limit risk by using things that are familiar. And that's so. Wh- where do you f- put? So I get the the um, return of this what we would call old content that's new again. Uh, I get the I get the over conversation, the hyper conversation, or disproportionate okay. emphasis in conversation and public conversation about shows like White Lotus and Succession that are sort of disconnected yeah. from what people are actually watching. Where do you fit the sort of what's in between those two eras, which are shows like The Wire? Right. Or or The Sopranos. 
Well, okay, so you're, those are two interesting examples because The Sopranos was a huge hit and was the key was a key moment, if not the key moment, in directing creative ferment on television away from the broadcast networks and onto cable and yeah. HBO and pay cable. The Wire, which is you know, uh, was never a hit. HBO made six seasons of The Wire because everybody thought The Wire was great. And The Wire was never a hit, but it was prestigious. And all HBO was trying to do, as my friend Rob Long constantly says, who writes our Hollywood commentary column for, for, um, for commentary, all HBO wanted to do was make sure that people stayed on HBO. Like, kept re didn't churn, didn't drop their subscriptions. So anything that contributed to that notion that you want to watch HBO, including that they had a show you didn't necessarily watch like The Wire, but you knew was very much something that other people thought was great, was good for them. Like it, it even if it didn't score audience, it was the the prestige sold the brand. Here's another example of how. Psychotic, By the way, can I say yeah. something about yeah. about the wire? Please. Yeah. This same chattering class that gets excited about shows like Succession and White Lotus also were the same category. I hate to categorize people. Ilk <laughs> sounds terrible. Who were very excited about. Uh, the Wire, and, mm -hmm. and and still is, by the way. They still are. The Wire was not... I don't think of The Wire as I think of, like, White Lotus and, and Succession. The, You know, about the breakdown and decay of urban, quote-unquote, liberal government, do, do I say, even though it wasn't, category, you know, characterized as such. The, you know, the police, you know, is interesting. Corrupt politicians running yeah. a city. The police were not the, the, the devils in that right. show at all. Um, you know, the breakdown in education, public education. I mean, you just think of some of the themes of, I think it was, that was the third season about the schools. Yeah. This was not, this show did not fit a liberal caricature of the way the world works. No, but it did feel fit. when you watch right. some of these other, yeah. like more modern versions of it, like, right. like Succession right. and White Lotus. But The Wire, David Simon, who was the guiding genius yeah. behind The Wire, He's a very radically left wing guy, and what is he? Th he thinks America is horrible. His problem is with American society in general, which perpetuates inequality, injustice, unfairness, racial division, and all of that. And so, all of this then goes under the rubric. I would say it's like liberals are ineffectual and and bad in Baltimore and the wire but they are just tools of the evil that is America so in that sense it serves very much it serves very much a thematic radical thematic purpose even as it's you know ruthlessly honest about what was going on but that but that third season could be like an advertisement for you know Eva Moskowitz and Success Academy yes. or for like the charter school movement <laughs> <laughs> it could, except then what are you doing? All you're doing then is perpetuating the, the system, which needs to be radically overhauled. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I, so in the end, I mean, the thing that we, we wanted to get to, and I guess we're, we're like we're That's way right. over time here, but we'll wrap it is yeah. in a couple of weeks or next week uh, on Peacock, which is – one of the least watched streaming services, which is NBC streaming service. That's why it's called Peacock. It's got what, something like 15 million subscribers? Something like that. I mean, it's very, and it's good. So no one yeah. really understands why its numbers are so low. It has a lot of good stuff on it. Nonetheless, Peacock has a show coming on called Poker Face. And it is uh, executive produced by Ryan Johnson, who made the Knives Out movies. Uh huh. Which are Netflix, by the way. Netflix paid him four hundred and fifty million dollars to make two Knives Out movies. So, just to give you an idea of how Netflix <laughs> was spending its money until uh, the second quarter last year, when suddenly everything yeah. changed. Um, so, Johnson's making Netflix, ma making Poker Face for for Peacock, and it's uh, there's an actress named Natasha Leone, and she's in it. And he went to Peacock and said, "You know what people loved Columbo? I want to make Columbo." Uh, guest of the week who's a murderer and we have to watch Natasha as she figures out 
how the murderer did it. Like that was the Columbo thing, right? You saw you saw the murderer do it, and then you watched Peter Falk break down and break that person down. Mm -hmm. Still a great show. Still like an amazing thing to watch. So he goes to Peacock. <clears throat> Peacock is now making Columbo with a. That's what poker. He explicitly he's making Columbo. So streaming the most radical disruption in the history of entertainment and all of that is now making a popular show from 1970. That's 52, 53 years ago, Columbo. He goes to them and says, let's make Columbo. They're like, great. So <clears throat> once again, proving streaming is a distribution method. And in the end, television is television. And people like good television and they don't like bad television. And they don't really care. And they like movies they don't care how they get it. So in my view, in other words, like why is streaming? It's like I keep thinking, why is streaming? And here's the other thing. Why is streaming better than networks? Why was cable? No commercials, right? That was, that was it. There's no commercials. And, and, and you can do it on your own schedule. Right. And no commercials. So now five years from now, there will be commercials on for right now. You can start paying less on uh, a right, lot of these Netflix. streaming services. Yeah. If you, if you agree to have ad support. Five years from now, that will not be a choice. The way in movie theaters, it was not a choice. Go to movie theaters, they show you some commercials, even though you paid for your ticket and all of that. Um, I think that... So even there, the advantage of streaming and cable is going to go away because they can, they're not going to be able to resist leaving... They can't resist leaving the ad money on the table. So then it's like, so put everything on the broadcast networks. The audience for the broadcast networks is theoretically 330 million people. Again, you have 100% market penetration. So I want to, before we wrap, one last yeah. thing. You mentioned briefly, I noticed you strategically just breezed by the role <laughs> of NFL and college football uh, in saving the television industry. So I just yeah. want to... Um, Pull up this one stat. I send you whenever these new stats come out about people's yeah. viewing habits about football. I I send them to you. I text them to you and and rub your rub your face in it because you know a little, about a decade. You're a ago, bigger you fan of that, yes, yeah. But you were what? also telling me that football was done. You know, and there was about a decade ago this during the Ray Rice controversy in the NFL. There was the sense that oh my god, football is on this downward spiral. So here we go. According to one recent uh, study, 82 NFL games. Are in the from this from 2022. 82 NFL games were in the 100 most watched TV shows of 2022. Right, right. now, to show you how crazy this is, on uh, on Christmas. So I watched all the Christmas NFL games. So on Christmas, uh, but well, some would say, "Oh, Dan, you're Jewish. You don't celebrate Christmas. Of course, you watch football." <laughs> but I'm not alone. So the Los Angeles Rams played the Denver Broncos. They were number 35 on that list of 100, the Broncos yes. and the Rams. Now, let me tell you, the Broncos finished the season 5-12, and 12, and the Rams finished the season 5-12. and 12. At the time, they were both 4-10, and 10, I think. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. They, were, they were both horrendous teams. It yeah. was a horrendous game. Yeah. That game got more viewers than any NBA game, any, any Major League Baseball game, any World yeah. Cup game, got more viewers than the Oscars or any scripted television show. Yes. A horrendous football game on yes. Christmas got more viewers than the Oscars or any scripted television show. Yeah. This to me is like, this is a, you know, people had written eulogies for football, right. you know, a decade ago. So that was foolish of me. But I mean, the whole question for me is, by the way, Alon, we have our cold open. That was it. That was foolish <laughs> of me. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. Keep going. Um, no, my, my presumption was that the stuff, and it, which has actually gotten worse in the last 10 years, but it, you know, the stuff with uh, CRE and the, and the concussions and all of that, you know, we're going we're gonna to create a national crisis for football. CTE, um, yeah. CTE, excuse me. Um, yeah. And I guess that hasn't <clears throat> happened yet generationally. Um, 
you know, you'll know that it's the case when parents in West Texas don't let their kids go out for the high school football team. It's not going to be the NFL that proves this. It's going to be the question of yeah. whether in 2045 parents are it, it would be like having your kids for parents in America go, being on a football team would be like having your kids stand on top of subway cars while they go through the you know where they go through the tunnels subway surfing you know like that if it doesn't get there football will be fine uh, but it needs that it's got to it's got to bubble up from the way i think there was a point at which boxing which was the most popular sport in the world something happened and people got disgusted by it or found it and boxing is still rates on pay cable and stuff but it's not what it and was. Like a hundred million at, people would watch a at, boxing match. Yeah, but the, but if, if you look at mixed martial arts today, yeah, it, which also has is a massive business and have a massive audience, and yeah. you look at WWE. I mean, this uh, the new CEO of, of yeah. WWE, Nick Khan. I was just listening to a conversation with him and Bill Simmons. I mean, he was going through the data. On, so I know, yeah, it's it's, enter, it's fake. It's not real wrestling, but yeah. you know, mixed martial arts is real. So there's there's successors right. to boxing. Oh no, yeah. I, I I agree. I'm just saying. I think that's a that was a question of whether or not the cultural. I mean, I just thought the cultural change was going to come faster, and it may not come at all. I don't know. I mean, in other words, like you know, all this like don't don't don't. Yeah, I understand. You want to coddle your kids. I want my kid to score a touchdown. Like that. That could be the cultural. That could be the cultural and, message and, of the next generation. Not and the know, power of live. The power of live. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't, I only, I assume that there would again be a be a cultural change that would affect the 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 viability of football. The power of live is very real because football is one of these. It, the whole thing about this is that these are things, and game shows are like this too, where you actually don't know what's going to happen. Right. You don't know what's going to happen in one of these games. Every game, every moment, is a plot twist. And that's exciting, and every th most everything else is formulaic, and there's a lot of fakeness, and people sense fakeness, and whatever's going on in football, it's not really fake. Uh, and I, I noticed this in part, not that I follow football as close, certainly not as closely as you do, but the outrage at calls... <laughs> which has been no, which is like a real thing always. And so, you know, umpires yeah. making a bad call on a pitch or something yeah. like that. But there is some sense in which what you're watching on a football field is too, you know, and this is a just contest. They're putting themselves on the line. It's a just contest. And then you have some figure from outside who says that was holding or that was, you know, you put your hand in somebody's face or that was roughing the passer or something like that. And, the rage that people have because they still think that this is also this is a contest of fairness and that someone's coming in and doing something that ruins that and it's a real emotion like people get totally crazy. So I want to insane. tell you two things and we'll wrap on that. One, the ease with which you could substitute these controversial calls with technology is is unbelievable, right? So what yeah. usually the call is, I mean, is you know when the, when the when the player does the player get in the end zone or not yeah. did the player get the first down or not was the player out of bounds or not if you had technology in the football you could yeah. actually see exactly yeah. where the football landed where did it make it over the line this is so easy to do of course if you inserted that it would remove this drama yeah. of this this ref making a call and then the coach on the sideline going yeah. bananas and the like all that that drama I, there's this guy Warren Sharp who's a like a sports betting analyst. He's got a podcast and a newsletter, and I watched him last night doing this riff about like doing the history, the statistical history of the different refs officiating uh -huh. certain games in the playoffs and what we should make of them and what we think of them and which ones get you know uh, uh, influenced by the home crowd and which <laughs> ones don't. I mean, it, by yeah. name and hit, like in the it's incredible. Like this becomes it's you can't remove the ref. It's part of the, it's part of the cast. Can I also say one thing about baseball that uh, one thing about football that that is true that that uh, uh, baseball partially has partially ruined itself because of the ability to do this kind of statistical isolating right. on things, right. and so therefore it's become very mechanical and data driven. 
and all of that. And there are just too many actors at any given point in a in a in a contest in a football on a football play, right? For that really to function, and there's so much improvisation going on if you're the quarterback or whatever, even though you're running a play. And I noticed last watching a game last night, there was this weird moment when a team when a team that was up like Is the 30, Giants Eagles game, Giants Eagles, right? Yeah. Where, the Eagles are up like 38 to nothing. <laughs> I know that right, wasn't that, but right. with 27, 28, 26 yeah. to nothing. And they were going to run a two point conversion. <laughs> like, why? And then so the broadcast, whoever the color said, well, you know, the, the analytics told them that they should do that. And then right. somebody had a moment on the sidelines where it's like, you know what, this would be a bad look for us. <laughs> kind of crazy right. when we're ahead 26 points just let them kick the 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 single point if that happened more in baseball baseball has had this flavor drained from it by the by the saber metrics and all of that right so um, i will say that john football just remains dramatic in a way that it, it does it's it's the best uh thanks for doing this. this is long i feel like like uh abe greenwald here i mean i barely got a word in <laughs> i'm like the abe i'm the abe of my own podcast <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, I appreciate you taking the time. This was great, <laughs> masterclass as always. Um, and um, thanks for doing it. We'll have you back on. Okay. That's our show for today. To keep up with John Podhoritz's work, you can do it at commentary.org. Go to commentary.org. I urge you to subscribe to Commentary Magazine and to listen to their podcast, their daily podcast. And John also has another podcast that he does with Jonah Goldberg and Rob Long about popular culture, or as they point out, about culture that used to be popular. It's called GLOP, G-L-O-P. Call Me Back is produced by Alon Benatar. Until next time, I'm your host, Dan Senor.